just a little bit about how I plan to finish the class out. So there's, there's five of these uh, practices to create uh, resilient disciples. One week I'm going to double up. I thought it might have been this week, but as I started studying, I was like, no, I want the whole time for this, this practice. But uh, one week I'll double up on and do two of these practices. And then, um, and then the final session I'll do, I want to talk about specifically about LGBTQ plus issues. Uh, and then do like a, some tech stuff, um, you know, basically how to um, lock phones down. You know, I say lock them down. I, I just mean how to make sure you're tracking them appropriately. How are they accessing them? How are they using them? Some specific tech stuff that you can use, some tools that you can use, things to be aware of. So, and LGBTQ plus uh, issues, uh, uh, I talked recently with a youth pastor, and, and he used this phrase that I uh, steal from him. He says that he thinks that LGBTQ issues are the Trojan horse uh, for a lot of the students, uh, Christian students that we deal with. It's like if you, they, they're they going to ask and wonder how you deal with this one issue, and then they'll make the decisions on the rest of everything based on how you deal with this. So if you, if uh, you know, the secular community would get you to be convinced that this should be okay, should be acceptable, that Christians should deal with this in a certain way. Um, even ones that don't identify as that, they still want to know what you do with that. Uh, and so I want to want to make sure we're having a conversation about that. I will say this past summer at Crossings, uh, every year we have time with the adults. So it's like the kids are out doing all the stuff, and uh, we have just, just the adults uh, come and we get some time with them and this was when I first started doing the Gen Z stuff was for, during this adult talk at camp and um, but this past year was on was on the LGBTQ issues and I had two guys uh, on basically on a panel with me uh, uh, one one of whom uh, his daughter uh, identifies as a lesbian and um, and then and another one I'll say people people who he's closely related to and in his family uh, struggle with it as well. And, uh, man, it was, it was eye-opening to just see, even in our Christian community, as we share that each week, each session of camp, it just a flood of people that were coming up to us after, after this uh, panel was over and just expressing, hey, uh, my kids, my pe pe a lot of students in my student ministry uh, dealing with this, struggling with this. So, anyway, we, we want to... We want to think uh, intentionally how we can meaningfully um, minister to this community, how we can be prepared for for the um, the fallout uh, after our basically our culture is is giving a, a specific message about what this means and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So anyway, we'll we'll devote some specific time to that and screens at the probably for the final final time that we're together. Uh, I want to do a quick. Uh, review as we think about the generations what are they where do you fall in uh, of and just it's a helpful reminder as you think about the other generations of how what it what were the things that uh, shaped influenced them where you fall in you can self-identify say yeah okay uh, I can see the things that I might be inclined to think or believe would are are indeed influenced by this so the lost generation these, these would have been the ones that would have come of age during uh, World War I. Those, the things shaping them were mass production of Model T, uh, prohibition, women's right to vote, a um, lot, lot of issues there. The next, the greatest generation. Anybody know, anybody know where it got that name? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah uh, they are. Well, Tom Brokaw named them. Um, that's what I meant more specifically, but that's also true. Yeah, you had the, they would have been shaped by the Great Depression, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, next to silent generation. Some people will include this, uh, this how silent they are. A lot of people just skip right over the silent generation uh, don't, and don't include them in stuff. Um, but those defining events would have been the Korean War, the space race, moon landing, uh, Cold War. Uh, President, President Biden is, is the first... Uh, present that's from this generation, the silent generation. So that was interesting to me. Um, boomers. How many boomers are in here? Okay. 
Yeah, okay. Um, so, of course, the uh, things shaping them with Vietnam War protests, Watergate, uh, Woodstock, uh, the JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. assassinations. What? I, th I don't know if JP talked about this. Why, why would have water, and what, to what degree was Watergate impactful for them? Yeah. It's just for, for the first time they're going, uh, well, we thought these people were upstanding uh, citizens, and it turns out that they're actually, uh, yeah, just like us. Yeah, or, yeah, now we'd say worse. But now, of course, then now you draw a parallel to what they are now. Um, well, it does make Watergate look mild, and if you if you there's a politician that doesn't cuss a little, they're like, this guy is a fake. He's he's not authentic. He's not a, a real authentic person that can be known. It's like you kind of want, well, I say you, society in general wants these authentic leaders now that that struggle with pe with things. It's it's odd to see. Um, Gen X. Uh, the things shaping them, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the AIDS crisis, the premiere of MTV. I thought that was, uh, you know, that's pretty crazy to think. Yeah, MTV coming along, uh, shaping a generation. Uh, the, for the first time, Gen Xers, they tended to, to marry later, divorce sooner. Um, you know, and then, then it brings us to the best, uh, the millennials. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, that's and that and I'm kind of in that zone too. I think a lot of this, you know, the dates are, you know, just kind of a a place for you to hang your hat on. But depending on where you were, I think would change a lot of it too. You know, it's like people in Kentucky are going to experience stuff a lot differently than than somebody that's living in New York City. Yeah, it's exactly. It's not so much about the date as it is about what truly surrounds you, and. You know, and you'll see that with at every one of these transitions, and um, and that that's certainly true for the Gen X and and millennials, uh, and I would agree with that because it, you know, uh, Brett and Patty Butler, when they were in San Francisco, were just talking about how radically different it is than what we experience here, um, and you know, you've got Frankfurt's insulated a little bit, you know, but you just go so far as to Lexington. I saw. I saw some stuff, you know, they had a St. Patrick's Day parade uh, that was, I was like, I'm sorry, is this a gay pride parade or is this just St. Patrick's Day parade? And, you know, you do, you see a lot of these, you get to places where universities are, it's a lot more accelerated, it's a lot more progressive. Uh, yeah, and, and on the coasts, um, it, it is interesting to see. But, yeah, it's a, you'll ultimately be shaped by, you know, what is it that's truly around you. Um, yeah, millennials shaped by, you know, you would see Obama's election, I think we'll, we'll look back and see very significant. You're, I mean, people learning kind of, hey, anything is possible here, stuff we didn't think could be so before, could be so. 9-11, the recession. The recession would have been impactful, again, as people will think about um, how do I prepare for life and work. So you had a lot of people, it's, I can't remember the exact, exact statistic for that recession, but the way it affected people is like, hey, as somebody I really loved had to move away from me to get a different job, uh, that was a very significant percentage of people. And then, yeah, they don't. They, well, you know, we're not talking about that explicitly today, but, you know, the, they view finances totally different. You know, it's like, you know, it used to be, hey, this is something that I'll invest in this. You're thinking, you're thinking big uh, future event. When you buy a home, this is like, okay, this is something that, that will at least help me buy the next home or prepare me for the future. And now it's fascinating to see uh, they're really just, they're more about the consumption of things. Uh, and I don't mean that in, in as critical a way as it sounds, but it is, you know, it's just like, hey, how do I get this thing? You, you go onto websites now and something's $21, and it's like, do you want to buy this with a payment plan? You know, do you want to buy this through a firm? You can pay, you know, you know. For payments for twenty bucks, you know, and they're like, "Sure, buy it." Yeah, you know, it's like, I was like, twenty dollars. That's a lot, but I'll pay four a few times. You know, um, it it is fascinating. Um, but anyway, then we we look at the defining events for Gen Z, uh, COVID nineteen. Of course, the first, when I first started this study, when I did, taught this class for the first time, 
people only attended half of it. And then the second half of it, I taught, which I'm sure nobody watched. I wouldn't have watched it either. Taught to that camera right there. Um, you know, because it was like COVID hit. Um, and Gen, Gen Z was already being deeply shaped by this world around them. And then COVID happened. Um, I cannot, I can't imagine uh, being a teenager during that time. But anyway, you had the Me Too movement, all the uh, racial justice protests, uh, Roe v. Wade's overturn. We'll see, we'll see how this goes, because now you've got, you know, all, it's all the discussion surrounding and ongoing as a result of what, what do we do now? Uh, Trump, of course, that's a pretty big, you can go either direction on that. Um, and then same-sex marriage, the Supreme Court ruling there. So all of these things are, are what's shaping their general psyche uh, and the way they see the world. And uh, of course, when we think, we think about the world in which we live, uh, again, the way, the way it's helpful to think about this is you just think about 50 or 60 years ago, uh, and the culture in which a Christian would have been operating is radically different than what they, they operate in now. Faith is pushed to the margins. It's not something that is, as, uh, you know, again, I always talk about it's like, how, how, is it, how do people hear it when you talk about you going to church? 50 years ago, it would have been like, oh, what church do you go to? And now it's say, hey, oh, I, go to, I go to Buck Run. It's, you're automatically labeled. Um, and we'd say, bring it on, right? Um, but pluralistic, it's accelerated, frenetic. The, the idol now is uh, fitting in, being up to speed, being in the know. And then the, for the believer, there is this bittersweet tension. Uh, there's some things that are really good about the world in which we live. There's a lot of stuff that I do not want to go back to in the 1950s or 60s, right? And so you're looking around, you're going, hey, this is actually pretty nice. Uh, and then, in, you know, the same things are also some that, that um, create big problems in our world. Uh, I don't want to go back to a time when texting is not a thing. You know what I mean? Uh, I hate talking on the phone. And so it's, I don't want to go back to phone calls. But, you know, I do think about the, the tension that there is, like, for instance, helping my daughter Stella know what's the appropriate uh, amount of conversation we have with her friends. You know? So bittersweet tension. Then as we think about this canvas, the discipleship canvas, what are the values, identity, and skills that we want to develop in Gen Z, uh, and then make sure that we're intentionally doing these things. So that's, all, that's just helpful. If, you're, if this is your home, uh, these are the people that you deal with, yeah, I would encourage you to make these lists and then be intentionally trying to develop these things within the people that you uh, have responsibility for. Then just, again, as a reminder, these are how we will talk about these things. We'll look at some stats here in a minute. Uh, and again, as you have those prodigals, people that have once identified as a Christian, no more nomads that have abandoned the faith. Habitual churchgoers. You know, it's, again, I would just emphasize, you know, think about the people surrounding you uh, and where they would fall on this. Now, again, this is, these are exclusively people uh, who grew up as Christians. But again, it is a helpful, helpful way to kind of discern uh, Gen, Gen Z and others. And then the practices we're looking to, practices we're looking to uh, develop within this generation. And I will tell you, that, um, you know, I know you, some of you guys are in here for different reasons because you deal with the Gen Z or you parent Gen Z or whatever. The more, the more I look at this, the more I see how in God's infinite wisdom, the church <clears throat> really is the best answer for Generation Z. Uh, the, ch the church, as they uh, do ministry, how they ought to do, speaks to all of the issues and concerns that Gen Z deals with on a regular basis. You know, that's, I think a lot of times we think, what, do, what is the new thing that we need to, to do? Really, we just need to make sure we're doing the, all the things that we were supposed to be doing all along. Um, the best way to reach Gen Z is with Generation Z. So it's equipping students. But for their discipleship, they really need those older, the older generations. So when we think about these practices and how we do them, it, it will be, it is a church responsibility. We'll need to be enlisted. Ne next week we'll be talking about meaningful relationships and how they help Generation Z. 
Gen Z is most, feels most connected to baby boomers. They relate best with boomers. That's fascinating to me. Um, they, the people that they want to hear from most and connect with are, and are receptive to the most are boomers. Um, and so, you know, we think, of course, this, this is not, not a slide on anybody in ministry, but in uh, so many churches... What, what we try and do is, oh, to reach Gen Z, let's get this hip, cool guy that acts like a kid and put him, you know, in youth ministry and have this guy lead him. And honestly, they're going, who's this joker that's trying to look like us, you know? Um, they're just not, not interested in that. But anyway, uh, in so many ways, hopefully you'll see how impactful the church as a whole is and hopefully how you'll, you will intentionally enlist uh, the help of others. And uh, in, in your ministry, with your family, with your kids, um, anyway, it's very meaningful. And then we think it's related to each one of these are the pressures. Uh, today we'll be on this, this next one, fighting anxiety, how shall I live in today's world? I don't mean, um, uh, well, you'll see what I mean. Um, uh, so this practice that we'll talk about uh, today is cultural discernment. That is um, helping Gen Z answer the question, how do I live in today's world? Cultural discernment means taking part in a robust learning community under the authority of the Bible in order to wisely navigate an accelerated and complex culture. Um, so cultural discernment means taking part in a robust learning community under the authority of the Bible uh, in order to wisely navigate an accelerated complex culture. Uh, do you feel like our culture is accelerated? And how, explain. In what ways? Amazon. Amazon. That's a great example. Yes. Yeah, like now something takes three days to get to your house and you're like, what did it, did it come to me? Wells Fargo? What's happening? You know? <laughs> yeah. What else? News cycle. News cycle. Yeah. Yeah, you just think about how you were, say, in middle school, and if you were to apply these pressures of life, this accelerated nature of the world in which we live, and put that on you, I mean, um, you know, I'll, I'll always try and preach. It's easy for us to sit around and be critical of Gen Z. It's just, you know, it's, it's going to be helpful sometimes for us to step back and go, how, how do I think I would have done with this? And golly, I... I'm so glad social media was not a thing uh, when, when I was that age. Um, if, I, if there had been a record of the stuff that I was doing, I would just, oh, my gosh. Or if my kids would have been able to go back, you know. One, here's, here's something to think about. One day, you're going to die, and your kids are going to miss you, and they're going to go, and they're going to look back at your social media, you know. And then what will they learn about you? What will they be reminded of when they go back and look at your social media? That, that's a sobering thought to me. Uh, you know, who are you presenting yourself to be? And what will your children, grown or whatever stage of life to be, be in when they go back and say, I just wish I could hear my dad's voice again. You know, I, I have a, on my phone a uh, message from a voicemail message from my grandfather and he's just talking about hey when do you want to come over and chop up this uh firewood you know and oh it's just a sweet memory to me but i did i can see very very um easily sometimes i'll just go and hear from pappy right you know what as people go back and look at your stuff what will they find and then are we helping them to see this is you're presenting yourself with something there's a summer staffer that um, at crossings, he, he goes back and will randomly post stuff that he posted, you know, when he was like 12. And it's hilarious, you know, it's just the stupidest stuff. And he posts it as a joke, you know. But well, I'm just glad that there is no record of all the dumb stuff I thought and said. Um, but man, they are, we're, we need to help them wisely navigate this stuff. Uh, complex, do you think the world is complex? In what ways? What is a woman? 
you, the stuff you thought was simple turns out to be complex. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, how often have you had in regular interactions with somebody online and then you meet them uh, and you're like, who is this? You know, you're, you're the most, uh, you know, articulate, um, outgoing person in this online space. And then you meet them in real life and you're like, you know, are you, do you want to be here right now? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, that's complex. Trying to navigate. It's like, oh, I thought I knew this person. It turns out I don't know this person. Or you have a, or you have a very personal relationship with somebody you know, and then they get online and they say some bizarre thing. You know, you're like, oh, I thought I knew them. You know, what else? Any other? I've got a, I've got a cousin. I mean, he's, I guess he's second cousin. He just, just got his driver's license. A friend of me on Instagram the other day, on in his bio is conservative Jesus freak. This guy can't vote. You know, it's like, you know, but he's gone ahead and said, this is, my, this is my identity. No, I'm not, I'm not here to criticize what he said, but what, it is odd that he's like, well, this is, if you want to know about me, I'm 16 and I'm conservative. You know, it's like, oh, cool. I'm glad you're thinking about this. You know, um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it is odd. Yes, yeah, exactly right. Any other ways? Well, you know, like- well, I was in North Carolina earlier this week and was listening to a guy, and he he said when he was a uh, when he was young, he's my age, and, and when he was a kid and a teenager uh, in North Carolina, businesses uh, shut down at one o'clock on Wednesdays, so you could in his town in in North Carolina, businesses would close at one, so that everybody could be at Wednesday night services that night. There was no thought of of uh, anything else, you know, just whether you went or didn't go, we didn't want anything to be in the way if you did want to go. Of course, that, then that was the pressure of, of the world. Uh, and, and Alan, I think to your point, you know, you, th- you think about the pressures that are on them. Journal- I read uh, this week or last week, people going to journalism, used to be you went to journalism for, hey, I want to break the story, I want to report the news. Now they see journalism as a form of activism. Uh, and that that was fascinating. Of course, if you read the newspaper, you're like, "Oh, this makes sense." Um, but yeah, to to them, journalism is activism. It's not it's not a way to report what happened. It's a way to to report my thoughts on what has happened, and uh, and they're constantly trying to communicate this. So we talk about discernment, cultural discernment. This is why I would ask. Well, maybe there's a question before this: Is discernment greater than knowledge? You can tell that I think it is by the way I asked this question. Um, you know, we'll talk about Chat GPT later in this in this lesson. Uh, knowledge, knowledge, it can be found by saying, you know, you said Alexa, and I and I, I actually felt a check in my spirit to make sure I didn't talk, so I didn't speak over Alexa's response. <laughs> that it really happened. Um, I was like, oh, we gotta wait for her to answer what <laughs> Carrie has said. Uh, cause that's like a pet peeve in my house. When I ask Alexa something, the kids are just talking. I'm like, would you be quiet? I'm talking to Alexa right now. <laughs> you know, so you guys, I was warning to score the game and, uh, you know, whatever it is. And, you know, it is, you can have a- access to anything. And, and even, you know, now what's fascinating, this chat GPT stuff as well, because you could say, Hey, t- communicate this to me. In, in the voice of Barack Obama, you know, it says, don't, don't just tell me this thing. Tell me this as if Barack Obama was telling me this. And with, with his, his patterns of speech and his vocabulary, would we'll communicate something to you. Uh, so when we think about what, what should we be instilling in our kids, it would be wisdom and discernment. Because knowledge, I mean, knowledge is... Well, one, I mean, I'm sure you probably have somebody in your life that's a very intelligent person that you just wouldn't trust uh, to a great degree um, or that knows a lot of the things. Because right now, you know, you can have access to, to any of the, the information. Uh, but, I, but what I'm proposing is that to, to teach discernment, cultural discernment, how, how do we live in this world? How do we interact with, with what's taking place would be far, far more imp- important. So we... Talk about the need 
We've touched on this already. Screens are profoundly changing the human experience. Um, it pushes the tyranny of the now. Uh, that is, you, you feel like everything is urgent and important. Um, you know, it used to be you'd have this grid that's like, is this urgent and important, urgent and not important, not urgent, not important. You know, and now it's like everything is in this one. If that red bubble gets up on that, it is like you've got to deal with this message. You've got, I've got to respond to this. Um, there, there, there are actual diagnoses for, for people that feel an anxiety as, re, as a result of unread messages or seeing those three dots in text when you get that you're waiting for somebody to respond and this feeling that you get. Um, anyway, it pushes the tyranny of the now. It's, it's hard for people to sort through what the most important things are. Um, framing and filtering reality. It's, it's hard for people to know if you, I mean, I mean, the filters, the filters that you can put on stuff are, are insane. Um, and it's hard to know. I can imagine a teenage girl that, seeing, that sees something and assumes this is how all people look. And she finds herself looking in the mirror and thinks, why do I not look like these people look? Um, yeah, that's a different type of filtering. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that, um, yeah, and you're just, you assume that what you're taking in is like what the world sees. And that's just not so anymore. It's, it's, so, um, it's so specific to your area and the things that you said that you've liked. And it's, everything's targeted. That's exactly right. Uh, this is a big one. I, weaponizing humor by making snark cool. Uh, I feel like that's man, just degrading the way that people interact with one another and the way they interact with comments. Twitter is the absolute worse at this. I mean, that is just a... There can be some really good stuff on there. The, you know, photography is one of my uh, hobbies. In Instagram used to be the place for photographers to kind of share and interact with their work. Now it's, you know, it's not so anymore. The photography community has shifted over to Twitter, uh, and they and they it's it's odd to hear people talk about how the interactions are radically different. So even on different social media platforms, you get a totally different. Um, way of interacting with people, a way of commenting on things. Uh, but we've made, we've made snark cool. Uh, overloading choices. You know, gosh, this, uh, again, later we'll talk about this fear of being obligated, but there's just such, so many options of what people can do. And then, you know, I, I remember when I, when I was a kid, you'd go, I'd go and I'd buy something. You know, of course, you know, it's when you're a kid, it's hard to come by money. It was definitely was for me. And I'd finally save up my 20 bucks or whatever it was. You go to the store and you buy a thing. And then as soon as you buy it, you're like, should have bought the other thing, you know. <laughs> uh, just multiply that times a million, you know, now. So even, even people choosing their vocation um, or whatever it is, is it's their, what they want to go to school for what they want to do on the weekend. Uh, they have overload of choices. Uh, filling our time, distracting our minds. I, I think um, there's a lot of trends and things that I think are neutral that I maybe don't like. I have an opinion on wide leg jeans or whatever. Um, you know, but, but who cares, right? They're not, they just don't matter. I think what social media is doing to our minds and shortening our attention span is evil um, and I think we ought to be building into our lives patterns that help expand our attention span uh, that help us to be able to focus you, you just think you just think and I'm guilty of this too how many times you've you've had a thought uh, I wonder about such and such and then you remember oh I have a supercomputer in my pocket and you get it out to look up this thing you thought of and you look at your phone and you see a notification and so you click on the notification, and you follow that rabbit trail, and then you go, why did I pull out my phone? Right? What is it that I was looking at? You know, and then you move on, and it turns out you really didn't need that information that you're going to access from your supercomputer anyway. But it's, we're so easily distracted. That's not healthy for us. That's not helpful for us. And, and um, again, it's easy to critique Generation Z. We're just not entirely different. Um, making people more image conscious. Uh, giving people a sense of interacting and participating. This, this is the odd thing about social media is it just makes you more isolated. 
uh, gives you, it gives people the sense that they've been interacting with people when, when instead it's really doing the opposite. Uh, now we think about, we think about where might somebody go for the answers. Uh, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, there was a form of AI that was first being beta tested and the guy put it on his, um, on a youth ministry website. And he told his students, hey, you can go on here. It was kind of, now you might say chat GPT is being left leaning. You know, there's a lot of discussions about that because how, how much can you trust this thing? But this one was specifically made to be biblically leaning. And uh, so keep in mind, this is 20 years ago. A guy puts it on his website, fairly revolutionary. And, and here's how his students interacted with it. First, uh, first they would just ask silly questions, uh, see if they could find the answer to this stuff. And they'd say, hey, what are the names of the seven dwarves? Right? So they're just testing what's the breadth of knowledge that this thing has. Then uh, it would do, make some sort of test question to make sure that it wasn't, uh, that it was truly a bot and not a person there just wondering what they were asking. So it repeat the question uh, and see if it would give the same response to know that, okay, this is a computer. Then they would give, and then they would ask a warm-up question that posed minim minimal risk, right? Uh, what does God think about tattoos? Does God exist? So a little more weighty. Then to get to the actual question that they wanted to ask, which was usually about sex, depression, suicide, or abuse. They were asking, how do I know if I'm gay? What does God think about masturbation? What happens to people who commit suicide? I had sex with my boyfriend, what should I do? Uh, these questions were not being asked in this guy's student ministry. They did start being asked to this chat bot. Uh, and that's, that's fascinating to me. Because these students increasingly have these questions. Where do they go for the answers? Right? If, if you have a young person in your life and they come and ask you one of these weighty questions of life, you can rest assured you are not the first person they've asked. You might be the first human they've asked, but it's not the first time they've asked a question. So when they're coming to you with these questions, They've already done some research on these things, right? And then the, typically they want to see if what you say aligns with what they have found, right? They're not, depending on the, the dynamic of the relationship, they're just looking to basically com, uh, confirm what they believed or confirm what they think about you. Uh, that's so, a sobering thought. Now, you, you take into account the other factors of life, am I in deep relationship with this person? Do I feel like this is a safe place for me to ask these questions? Do I feel like this person is typically bringing up these types of questions and concerns? Uh, then, then you have a different dynamic with this person that you're interacting with them. A lot of times it's, you know, one, you, you can't embarrass um, Gen Z on, you know, deep uh, or sexual things. You know, it used to be that, you know, there, there were things that people knew you just didn't say at church or you didn't ask at church or maybe this, this would be a question I'll ask. But, you know, I've, I've been in a room with teenagers where they did Q&A time and a room full of peers, they, a room, yeah, a room full of peers, one of them stands up and says, is it wrong to masturbate? You know, and all the adults were like, oh, oh, you know, it's like, somebody didn't tell him, you know, you don't say that. Um, but uh, yeah, but all of his peers were like, oh, yeah, good question, good question. You know, uh, Christian context, you know, mixed company. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, shocking. Uh, yeah, I know I can see all the like, I can't believe he said it. <laughs> you know, um, I mean, yeah, so they, they have these questions. They're not embarrassed by them. You know, they're, if anything, when we don't bring it up, they're thinking they don't know the answer to this question. Shameful. Yeah, that's exactly right. So we, we're, our, our uh, kind of cringe factor is way off from theirs. Um, and, and, again, their assumptions are we don't care, we don't know the answers, uh, or I'm weird because they're not dealing with the things that I'm dealing with. Uh, none of which are really the things that we hope to be communicating 
to this generation. Um, and so a lot of times, man, you just, in discussion with your kids, you just bring it up. I'll say my own experience, of course, I'm not, obviously not Gen Z, but I did feel like my parents were a place where I could go and ask this thing uh, because they were bringing it up to us. Um, when, I, when I was 11 and then when I turned 16, we, we, I went on a trip with my dad, and, um, and he, he made sure to let me know that his cringe factor was way further than mine. Uh, <laughs> and he still does that. I'm just, uh, you know, but yeah, when those things came up, I knew, okay, he, he saw about this, he's thinking about these things, he's engaged in this way, and I felt like that was a place to go. I still think that holds true that uh, our kids want to know that we've thought about this. Well, not just sexual stuff, but any of these, these big issues. Uh, and I'll get, get to some resources for what that is. Um, but again, I, and I do, I do want to talk a little bit more about ChatGPT right now. Um, but just briefly, here, here's an example. A friend of mine on Facebook uh, went to ChatGPT this week, and here, here's what he asked. Uh, Give me a new Ten Commandments as they might be written by a self-help preacher, okay? So he asked ChatGPT, give me 10 commandments that might be written by a self-help preacher. Number one, believe in yourself. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You have a purpose in this world that only you can fulfill. Have faith in your abilities. Trust your instincts and never doubt your worth. Yeah, yeah. But, but what's interesting to me, it, it, it incorporated biblical language. You're fearfully and wonderfully made, all right? Number two, put your dreams first. Don't let anyone or anything stand in the way of your dreams. Pursue your passion with everything you've got and never settle for less than you deserve. Number three, speak life. Your words have power, so use them wisely. Speak positively and encouragement into your life and the lives of of others and watch as your world begins to change. Number four, take time to rest. In the midst of your hustle and bustle, don't forget to take time to recharge your batteries. Rest is crucial to your success, so don't neglect it. This is a great social media post. (laughs) Uh, I'm joking, but, you know, this this is what you read, right? Uh, I'm not going to read all of these in totality, but, I mean, here's the rest of the list. Honor your mentors. Stay true to yourself. Practice forgiveness. Cultivate inner peace. Practice gratitude. Keep your eyes on the prize. Um, you know, that all sounds super good. And if you, if you take, even take something like this, right, this isn't just overtly nefarious, um, you know, or evil. But, you know, you take somebody that's, that's young or young in their faith and you give them something like this, it incorporates scripture and i i mean i watched this thing a couple of weeks ago it's basically hey how do you have chat gpt generate social your next 30 social media posts you can integrate chat gpt into canva which is like a design um, online des, uh, design platform you can integrate these two things so it's, it's making the posts in your voice that's how you speak it goes ahead and designs it for you and then posts it online and then people will consume that with the assumption that that's you saying this thing, right? And it's like, um, we need discernment, you know, is the point, point of this. And we need to help, you know, our, the people around us are, are asking, how do we live in this world? Um, big answer, how, uh, how churches build cultural discernment. I'm sorry, this is, this is a little hard to read. Uh, but here's what was asked. All right, to ask to these, to these students, um, they were the, the range is 18 to 29 year olds, all right? How does, uh, here was the question, which of the following, if any, do you regularly experience in your church or faith community? Mark all that apply. And here are the questions, all right? So is your church, does your church give you wisdom for how to live faithfully in a secular world? So, this is, again, you see the resilient, how the resilient disciples answered, habitual churchgoers answered, and you're nomads and you're prodigals. So they, 
Resilient disciples, 70% of them said, yeah, my church gives me wisdom for how to live faithfully in a secular world. The next one, wisdom for living with people who believe differently than me. A, fear, a lot of times we're, we're trying to help them surround themselves with people that feel the same as me, right? Or, see the, or, or believe the same as me, as opposed to how, how do we live faithfully with people that believe differently. Uh, the next one, the church helps, helps me with living wisely when it comes to sex and sexuality. You see their answers there. Or help with living wisely when it comes to technology. You know, this ought to be something that, that's just a part of our rhythms. How do you engage with this stuff? What are the tools uh, that you need? What is it? Because I'll tell you, I mean, again, we'll, we'll plan on talking more about technology, but the greatest opposition you have to, to uh, working with your kids in their technology is are the parameters or lack thereof with their peers. You know, what, is the, what are the apps they have? What are the access that they have? What are the times that they're using it? Um, you know, but man, if you get, you get in your, your community of faith and people have the same values and operating similarly, uh, you know, that makes it a lot, a lot better. Uh, then, then talking about tools for wisely managing my money. What's the biblical principles for how you manage money? You know, one thing I see with, um, with our staff, um, and one, one thing we're going to start doing is offering to not pay them until the end of the summer. Give them one lump sum at the end of the summer because they're self-identifying. When I get paid, I can't not Amazon things. Um, Because it is funny. It's like, man, it's almost somebody's full-time job during the summer is just delivering the Amazon packages to our 70 staff. I was like, you know, you, it's, it, I mean, you just, you, I can give you the date. You, you can come to camp this summer and you will see a flurry of Chacos show up ex- <laughs> exactly three days after that first paycheck hits. Uh, and it's like, you, you know, it happens, everybody gets paid. And then, then, you know, three days later, whatever it is, it's just like Chaco boxes. It's a very, it's a very identifiable box that comes in the mail. Uh, and it's like, well, we know exactly what happened. Um, and they're buying the craziest stuff. I, one, one kid, summer staffer, um, you know, they're making next to nothing all summer long. Uh, but he, one of our themes for one of the fellowship nights was like Marvel characters. And he, he went on Amazon and bought a $100 gauntlet um, Thanos hand, <laughs> that, that glove that had the jewels in it. And it made noises and it was awesome. Uh, and I wanted it. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> and I was so jealous. No, I actually, yeah, anyway. Um, I bought my own, but I have more money. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the stuff they're doing uh, with their funds. And again, we, we alluded to this with how they're, they f- will finance anything. I mean, there's, these places are making a killing now on, on people financing very, very small and seemingly insignificant things. So, I mean, even our church. Yeah, what are the churchgoers? So, so the habitual churchgoers go just about as much as uh, the resilient disciples. They go just a little bit less to church. Um, you know, I do... I, it, I mean, what they're being taught obviously matters, but I don't think it, I don't think it just comes down to what they're teaching in their churches. Um, and here's there's something else I would say. The danger here is heaping some sort of pressure on somebody that, you know, has a Gen Zer, if you will, that doesn't then goes off and doesn't is the proves to not be a resilient disciple. Right, because then it's you don't you can't reverse engineer it and then say if I had just done this and this and this, then I would have produced this thing. But I feel like that's just, you know, that's not so. I mean, you can't. I don't. So I would I would hesitate to try and heap pressure on somebody's head for to say, well, if you just had them in the church that taught this, they've been a resilient disciple. I don't want to say that either. But they are, these things do matter. They do help. But it's certainly more than that as well. Alan, were you? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so right now, a big trend um, is de- de-influencing. Have you seen this? Um, so it's all of these, uh, all of these 
it's like a new growing trend that you say, I've been influenced to buy this thing, right? Now you have people that are coming out there and saying, hey, don't buy that stuff. You know, because there, there was like a trend, and you kind of saw it's like, hey, buy all this cool stuff, and you see all this person that has all these cool things. And then it moved over into, well, hey, here's how you can have the cool thing for less money. Then a little bit further, it's like, hey, here's the cool thing, but Walmart made it. And now it's like, you don't need that thing. You know, and, and, and so I, I'm telling you right now, this is, this is what you will see in the next year or two years is people going, uh, and, and I don't remember what the hashtags are, and that's for TikTok, but it's, um, you know, you, you do have these people that are saying, hey, I'm going on a spending fast. I'm going to try and not spend any money this month. Uh, and I do think it's a, one, I think it's a response to how much stuff is costing right now. Uh, and then the fact that they're knowing, hey, I can't actually achieve what this person achieved. One, because it was sent to them for free, um, and and I'm not like that. And then, and you do, I do think you, you've, you're noticing something that's kind of swelling right now as people going, um, hey, it turns out I don't need the best thing. I don't even need the Walmart version. I just don't need this thing. Um, and I and I think that's awesome. And I and I hope that continues to grow. Well, and that's exactly what ha- that's exactly what it is. Uh, but I think it it opens doors for conversation. That's going, yeah, okay. But this you can you can identify. Hey, this was people were doing this, and then they found out one. This is just not a lifestyle that you can support, and two, this is not fulfilling. Uh, how how I do think there's great gospel conversations that come as a as a result. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And then, and this generation is more entrepreneurial than any other. I mean, it's 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 crazy one because they've just seen people around them achieve all manner of crazy stuff, and uh, whether it's YouTube or or whatever, they're going, "Hey, I feel like I could do this." And then, and they go and get their Google PhD in coding, and you know, I know I could, could get if somebody knows how to code, I I can get them a hundred fifty thousand dollar job today. Yeah. You know, um, anyway. We digress a little bit. And then building, build our lives on the Bible. Um, again, that's one thing I love about all this stuff. It's like, oh, what's the answer for all this? Church and the Bible. Um, you know, you didn't need this class for that. <laughs> um, but, again, you do, it is have to be framed, and it has to be, you know, um, man, truly from a uh, regenerate person, you know. Uh, but here, just breezing through. You just see it's, it's fascinating. The people that are really taking this seriously, here's what they say about the Bible. It's inspired word of God and contains truth about the world. Of course, 100% of the resilient disciples said that because to be a resilient disciple, you had to have said that. So for you to match that criteria, that's why it's 100%. Uh, reading the Bible makes me feel closer to God. Bible teaching I receive in my church is relevant to my life. At church, I get wisdom for how the Bible applies. Uh, at church, I gain a greater love for the Bible. The Bible is the foundation of all the teaching at my church. The Bible is totally accurate in all the principles it teaches. And the Bible contains everything I need to know to live a meaningful life. And this, this is just a great list to even kind of take and say, hey, do I know where, how, do I, would I know from Scripture how to communicate this to someone? You know, would I, would somebody say, yeah. Because Here, here's what students are having to do today in college. They, they're forced with a choice between money or meaning. What's better about Gen Z than most of, the, most of our generations is they are more motivated by meaning than they are by money. Um, but, then, but then there's this clash of worldviews because all of our communication of them is like, how are you going to make money? That's a question they need to answer, <laughs> right? So don't hear me. I mean, there's a lot of like, people going study in art that like, I don't know, they're going to have to do something else. But, you know, they have to answer that question, but, but there's a conflict of worldviews, and I think a lot of times we're talking to them from a, a provision perspective, and they're wanting to know that what they're doing makes a difference. Um, why, would I, why would I do that? Why do I want to be that thing? And again, early on, you know, when I was studying this, and, and you'll hear this, you come to camp, you talk to, the, to our staffers, it's none of, you say, hey, what do you want to do? Nobody wants to be a doctor, Right. They want, to, they want to work at a hospital in a low-income uh, community 
uh, where they do specific things to people that can't afford good health care, right? So they won't be a doctor, but they, they like package it. They have to convince themselves that this is like a meaningful, helpful thing. Um, and and that's, that's how they're approaching these. Um, but anyway, the, you take this list, um, you know, and one, you, you will see a lot of these people that are, are deconverting and whatnot is because of the distance they've put the, between themselves and the Bible. You know, it's, it's through sin choices and life choices and patterns of life, you distance yourself from Scripture, then, then you deconvert. Um, you know, when it's like, you, it's not, people aren't having the um, anti-Damascus Road experience where they're in deep relationship, doing all these things, they're invested in their church, invested in their walk with Christ, um, and then all of a sudden they realize it's all false. Uh, that's not what happened. Sometimes it might appear that way, but that's not what's happening. Um, and then we know that ha- habits, habits make a big difference. Again, don't hear me implying that if you just force your kid to be in church all the time, and spend a bunch of hours taking in Christian material that they'll end up a resilient disciple. But those that are resilient, it is true that they take in almost twice as much as the next closest person of Christian content. That counts being in church, listening to podcasts, spending time in the Word. Uh, and th- these are just averages. And honestly, I wish it was higher. You know, because this, th- this average is about 10 hours a week that you spend dealing with Christian content for your, for your resilient disciples, almost just almost 11 hours a week. Um, you know, if you go to church on Sunday mornings and you're here from 9 until noon and you do, you've got your student worship on Sunday nights and then you come here on Wednesday nights, uh, you're basically to nine hours. Uh, and that, I would consider that pretty, a pretty minimalist approach. Um, so, now, again, those, like I think of our D groups and stuff that Stella is involved in, and they're, I mean, they're encouraging them to be in the Bible every day. These are, these are all wonderful things, and we would say what, what it's doing is building in the habits of resiliency. Um, I'm going to kind of buzz through this uh, last part. So if we, the, my favorite example of, of this cultural discernment in all of Scripture is Daniel. Uh, Daniel and his friends. Because what, what you see there, I think what we've always focused on when, in the story of Daniel is the stuff he didn't do, right? Well, he didn't eat this, and he didn't drink that, and he said, set apart. They took on names of Babylonian gods, right? They went to Babylon University, uh, but they just separated themselves in specific ways. There were specific ways that they did not interact and engage and they said, hey, we're not going to do these things. But again, we can talk about the, the hermeneutics in this passage. But I, I would say it was not because of the law that they were prohibited from doing these things. I would say it, it was because of their affections. They wanted, to, they wanted to make sure that their affections were rightly placed. And they would have, if they chose not to eat of the king's food, they would have a three-time daily reminder that this is not our home. Because so many times we're trying to find a way to make, make this feel more like home, when in reality it needs to feel more foreign uh, to us. It needs to feel less like home. So David did the stuff, and he, as a matter of fact, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the best at the stuff that y'all do uh, because of my faith uh, in God, because of the one who I serve. Uh, so, you know, they didn't, they didn't withdraw because the temptation is, you know, you look at the culture, you see the way things are going, and you just, uh, the temptation for me all the time, I hear stuff that my kids are interacting with, I just be like, throw all the phones all the way, you know, uh, just get rid of it, burn it all down, and let's go be hermits. But, you know, that's not it. Because that, the result of that is self-righteousness. When you're known by all the stuff you don't do, you're just a self-righteous person, right? If you, if you want to be known, hey, I, well, I don't do this, I don't do that, I don't do that. It's like, well, great job. You know, that's. And that honestly is is a great temptation because we love to be able to stand somewhere and say, "Well, I don't do I don't do X, Y, and Z." Um, but neither is it the opposite end that you're just assimilated into society that there's no distinguishable no distinguishable difference between you or your family and the world at large, uh, because the result of that is worthlessness. 
right? Uh, the scripture, what is it, uh, salt without its saltiness? What's it good for? It's not even good for the manure pile, right? Uh, you just throw it away. Uh, so when you, you know, these are the things that you typically find is like you either, you know, you're, you're kind of um, pharisaical in what you do or don't do. Uh, and so it creates a self-righteousness within you, or you just look just like everybody else, the patterns of your life, there's, aside from what you do on a rainy Sunday morning, time change Sunday. Um, you know, otherwise it's not, not distinguishable. So what would I recommend? That is in engagement through resolve. And that, that's the, the line that I like in this. Uh, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself uh, with the king's food or the wine that he drank. Uh, it's through resolve. We say, hey, this, this, um, we're not going to participate in these things, uh, or we're going to engage with them meaningfully and know what it is, but the result in that is homelessness. It will increasingly feel like this is not where we belong. Uh, the more that we engage with this stuff and try and navigate it meaningfully. Uh, this uh, last deal, I'm, you know, try and uh, ask the right questions media engagement, there's obviously things that we should just should not uh, participate in, things that we just should not, I think, you know, um, you know, you just need to know yourself and, and, and your spirit and your, your condition to know what you should and shouldn't engage with. Some things are overtly wrong and some things would be unwise and some things are fine. But I think as we engage with it, there's three questions I love to ask. Where is God? Uh, how does this claim life works? And where is hope? And redemption. So you take any kind of media that you take in, you know, you would ask this question, where's God in this, all right? And a lot of times anymore, it's just like there's no notion of God. Maybe there's a higher power. Maybe there's his acknowledged in some way or shape. But, but then there's some things that are implicit as well. Now, if there's no notion of God in a thing, I don't, I'm not saying that that eliminates it from its usefulness. I'm thinking a lot of times what you'll find is, hey, there's, here's, a, here's a story, and, you know, and here's you know, whatever it's make this making this claim about how life works, there's no presence of God. Well, how is where is the notion of right coming from? Or or you're going, there's no notion of God in this thing. And how did this turn out for these people? Well, this went really bad. You know, I think even for your kids, you're in as you're interacting with this stuff, you're going, Well, there's no notion of God here, but this is a great illustration of why we need God. You know? Uh, and this is a beautiful thing. And then where is hope and redemption? You almost, you almost don't ever find anything without some notion of hope and redemption in it, right? And, you, and that's a great way to communicate. This is what people are hungry for. This is what they're trying to answer. This is they're trying to satisfy this. Um, and then some question uh, of personal evaluation. And I'll ask these if you want to resonate with you. Do I understand my relationship as a Christian to culture? Do I know how to reflect on and respond to culture? Do I understand my identity apart from culture? Am I driven by fear of culture? And do I see how Jesus enters culture to meet people? And then do I understand my role in representing Jesus in my culture? Um, and then, uh, then a few resources. I, I would really uh, encourage you to, to take some of these. Of course, we, we need to be a part of a robust learning community. The people I'm in relationship with, I mean, this... We read these things, we listen to this stuff, we talk about them together, and you've got to be into some sort of situation where you're regularly communicating with people about these things. You're regularly, you know, because, I mean, I was telling Candace just the other night, I was com coming back from North Carolina, I was with some guys I work with, and we started to talk about some stuff in the world. And frankly, I was, I was feeling an overwhelming sense of despair and fear. Um, it was private. It was just in me, as I was hearing this, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm raising my kids up in this. And, you know, until one guy said, but, but, here's where the hope of the gospel speaks to this. And, and I just thought, man, this is what I need to focus on. And, and uh, to be a part of communities like that, we're identifying, hey, this is awful, evil, a uh, terrible world, you know, but there's the hope of the gospel. Uh, and as people learning, this is a robust learning community. People are hearing these things, talking about this stuff. It's not foreign to them. We're not going to be surprised by it. Resources I recommend, of course, the briefing by Dr. Mueller is a great resource. Is he's just talking about current events and how a Christian perspective uh, on on issues that are happening every day. 
any Rebecca McLaughlin books, great book I think every teenager should be required to read is um, 10 Questions Every Teen Should Ask and Answer is great. Um, and I like, she illustrates it beautifully. Uh, Stella, who is 12, started reading that and, um, you know, it, she can understand it. She's 12 years old. And like some of the topics, I think it's 10 questions every teen should ask and answer. I think it's in my backpack, actually. In the front. Um, but I have a copy. No, not that, the one behind that. Um, and then she's got uh, Confronting Christianity is another one of her books. Um, which is great as well. And anyway, everybody should be familiar with that one. It's the question she asked her. Ten questions every teen should ask and answer about Christianity. Yeah, there you go. It's Any killer. That she has. Yeah, everything she puts out is gold to me. Um, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the bittersweet tension. We love this. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Uh, anyway, it's, it's great. And she, yeah, the confronting Christianity is just a little more uh, adult approach to that. Um, yeah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, but it's great. Um, anyway, I'll have those up there. Feel, feel free to thumb through them. The questions. You ought to ask yourself the questions whether or not you read the book or not. And then this is my favorite thing right now. Access.org. Uh, used, to, used to be you had to pay for it. And when I say used to be, like a month ago, you had to pay for this. Uh, Subscription-based. Right now, it's 100% free. Uh, and ne from now forward, it's 100% free. It is the best has the best content uh, for, it gives you uh, discussion guides, like how do you talk to your kids about LGBTQ issues? Uh, how do you talk to them about masturbation? How do you talk to them about pornography? How do you talk to them about how to uh, use social media? It's got these parent guides, it's got this uh, discussion guides, and, and you, if you do anything, sign up for the Culture Translator email. The, um, they, they have an email. It's called the Culture Translator. It gives you three things that happened uh, in the week, um, and, then, and then they talk about them. Uh, and they have three podcasts, which are called Culture Translator, Deep Dive, and One Conversation. At the end of the Culture Translator, they usually will take, like, one of the topics. Like, this week's one is fascinating. I know we got to go. Um, there's a trend on TikTok that it's you put this filter on, like, you, uh, people our age put this filter on it makes you look like yourself as a teenager it's wild right so I, read, I don't have tiktok i read this article about it i got emotional um it was and it's these people and it shows their face and then like with the teenage filter it's remarkable that i show i showed it i showed it to uh, 20 somethings this week and they said which one's real you know they didn't know the context of the of the uh article but they said, which one's the real one? And I was like, the old one's the real one. They were shocked. Um, but then people were, these people were taking this, um, putting this filter on, and they would play Forever Young or um, uh, The Freshman by the Verve Pipe, great song, and, um, and then would address what themselves as a teenager, what they wish they would have known as a teen. Uh, and, oh, it was heart-wrenching, really. And... Um, you know, anyway, I learned about that through the Culture Translators. Fascinating. Then they, then they take a deep dive into this. What's the biblical perspective on this? How do you talk to your kids? What are some questions you could ask your kids? Hey, have you seen this? Are you engaging with this? What do you think about this? Why do you think that's striking a chord with people? Uh, here's, and, the, and then they encourage you, hey, talk, ask your kids. Tell your kids, I wish somebody had told me, you know, X, Y, and Z. I wish somebody had told me, uh, don't be so worried about, you know, how you're spending your weekends or whatever. You know what I mean? Um, and anyway, it's great, great content. Culture translator, deep dive. They take that deep dive. And then one conversation is they take big issues, uh, and then they try and help you uh, to prepare for a meaningful conversation with somebody.